Сейчас проверим. Ага, вот вроде идет. Окей, okay, so the previous lecture we introduced <coughs> uh, the minimal C star tensor product or the spatial tensor product of C star algebras. Uh, so let's recall the construction. Uh, suppose we have two C star algebras, A and B. Uh, we denote by omega A the universal representation of A. And simil similarly, omega B is uh, the universal representation of B. Universal representations. And we define the norm on uh, the tensor product, on the algebraic tensor product of A and B by the following formula. We consider the tensor product representation omega A, omega B. So we recall that the tensor product representation is uh, the representation of A tensor B, of the algebraic tensor product, uh, on the Hilbert tensor product of the spaces H A and H B. So we consider the tensor product representation. Uh, let's recall that it is faithful. In general, the uh, tensor, product of, tensor product of two faithful representations is also faithful. So this representation is faithful. We apply it <coughs> to our element U. We get an operator. And we calculate the operator norm of this operator. Uh, and this is the spatial or the minimal Uh, C star norm on the tensor product. It is in, this is indeed a norm because the representation is faithful and uh, the C star axiom follows from the fact that it is, that it holds in this algebra. So as a result, um, the product becomes um, a pre-C star algebra and if we take the completion, we get a C star algebra which is denoted like this. So this is the completion of the algebraic tensor product equipped with the spatial C star norm. And it is called the spatial or the minimal uh, C star tensor product. Of A and B. Why is it minimal? Um, there is an important theorem due to, to Takesaki. Um, we didn't prove it because it's rather non-trivial. It states that um, this norm is indeed uh, the smallest possible C star norm on the tensor product. And because of this, uh, this uh, the minimal tensor product is usually, is often denoted like this. And this norm is denoted like this. The, mi the minimal C star tensor norm. Okay, so this is our basic definition. It's very short, uh, but it is not very useful. Uh, first of all, uh, the problem is that um, the spatial C star norm given by this formula uh, is uh, almost impossible to, to calculate uh, because it, it involves uh, universal representations. And the universal representation of a C star algebra is something really huge. Uh, it involves all states. Uh, normally, it acts on, an, on a non-separable Hilbert space. And it's um, in, impossible to, to describe it in, it in reasonable terms. Um, and the second disadvantage of this uh, formula, of this definition, is that it is not functorial. Uh, so um, our first goal for today uh, will be to show that um, in spite of the fact that the definition is not functorial, 
the construction itself is functorial. And to prove this, uh, we, we will need another equivalent definition of the uh, spatial C-star norm. So we have the following theorem. For every element u in our tensor product, uh, the spatial C-star norm is uh, equal to the following supremum. So we consider all possible star representations, star representations of A and B respectively, and we take the supremum. So here pi is a star representation of A, <coughs> and two is a star representation of B. Uh, so to prove this result, well, first of all, let's observe that um, this number already belongs to this set. We can take pi equal omega a and two omega b. So this number is already in this set, so of course this is less than or equal to, to the supremum. And to prove the, to, to prove the equality, uh, we have to show, we have to show that mm, for each pair of representations pi and two, we have the following inequality. For each element u in the tensor product. Because the opposite inequality is uh, uh, well, because uh, this number is, in, is already in this set. Okay, uh, so why is it so? Uh, to prove this inequality, we first of all uh, observe that we may assume from the very beginning that pi and tor are non-degenerate. We may assume that pi and tor are non-degenerate. Why is it so? Well, let's recall that an arbitrary star representation uh, can always be decomposed as the direct sum of uh, a non-degenerate representation and uh, a trivial representation which acts uh, as trivially by zero. And similarly for two, where pi prime and two prime are not degenerate. Uh, and it's clear that uh, in this case we have the full inequality. If we take the tensor product representation of pi and two uh, and calculate the norm of this operator, it is exactly the norm of this operator, simply because uh, this operator, this operator is just the direct sum of this one and, uh, uh, and the, uh, the zero operator. Uh, so everything is reduced to non-degenerate representations. Okay, now a pi and tau are non-degenerate and let's recall now that a non-degenerate representation can be decomposed as a Hilbert direct sum of cyclic representations. Pi is unitarily isomorphic to the Hilbert direct sum of uh, a family of cyclic representations, and the same is true for two. So here all representations, pi, pi i, and two j are cyclic. And finally, let's recall that a cyclic star representation of a C-star algebra is unitarily isomorphic to a GNS representation. So each pi i is isomorphic to the GNS representation pi pi i, and uh, each tau j is isomorphic to pi g j for some states, for some states uh, f i on a and g j 
Point B. And let's now calculate the norm, pi tensor 2 of u. First of all, it's a simple exercise to show that this is unitarily isomorphic to the double Hilbert direct sum over i and j. Uh, pi i tensor to j. So the norm of this operator is equal to the norm of this operator. And the norm of the, of the direct sum is equal to the supremum. Uh, this was some time ago, this was a little exercise when we discussed the Hilbert direct sums. Um, so this is the supremum over i and j of the norms of the respective operators pi i tensor to j. But we know that each such representation uh, comes from a state. So they are generic representations. And therefore, this supremum is less than or equal to the supremum taken over all states f of a and over all states g of b of the following operators, pi f tensor pi g of u. And what is this? This is exactly the norm uh, of this operator. Because by definition, omega is the sum, the Hilbert direct sum of all, this, of, uh, all representations pi f, and omega b is uh, the Hilbert direct sum of the representations pi g. So this is exactly uh, what we need. Omega a tensor omega b applied to you. <coughs> and that's it. So this is exactly the inequality that we wanted to prove. So this completes the proof. Well, by using this result, we can now easily prove the functoriality of the uh, spatial tensor product. The corollary. Uh, suppose we have two uh, star homomorphisms between C star algebras, phi from A1 to B1, and psi from A2 to B2. Star homomorphisms between C star algebras. We may consider their algebraic tensor product, phi tensor psi, which acts from the algebraic tensor product of A1 tensor A2 to B1 tensor B2. So we know that this is star homomorphism. And I claim that this homomorphism uniquely extends, uniquely extends to a star homomorphism uh, denoted like this between the uh, spatial tensor products. So as a result, we see that the spatial tensor product is a functor of two, of two variables on the category of C star algebras. <coughs> uh, to prove this corollary, it's enough to show that this map, this homomorphism between the uncompleted tensor products uh, is bounded for the spatial C star norms. It suffices to show that, that uh, phi tensor psi is bounded with respect to the spatial uh, C star norms on the tensor products. Uh, because, uh, well, these two algebras are just the completions of these two. So if this is indeed the case, then we simply extend it by continuity to the completions. And uh, the uniqueness is clear because uh, this is automatically bounded. And so the, uh, the, uh, exi the, the uniqueness of, the, of, the, of, the, of this map is clear just by, by, by density and continuity. 
So why is it bounded? Uh, well, we take uh, an element u in A1, uh, sorry, A2, and let's uh, try to apply mm, phi tensor psi to u. Uh, so by definition, this is, what is this? This is the norm of the operator omega b1 tensor omega b2. So we apply the universal representations of b1 and b2 respectively uh, to this concrete element. Phi tensor psi applied to you. And we observe now that this uh, expression can be written in the following way. This is uh, omega b1 composed with phi, tensor omega b2 composed with, with psi, and then applied to you. And these two maps, omega b1 and omega b2, o omega b1 phi and omega b2 psi are star representations of a1 and a2 respectively. And so now, if we now apply our theorem, we see that this number is less than or equal to the uh, spatial norm of u by theorem. And this completes the proof. So this inequality shows that this homomorphism is bounded, and so we can uniquely extend it to, uh, the, to homomorphism between the completions. Okay, so, um, so the new definition of uh, the spatial tensor norm given by this theorem um, has uh, the advantage of being functorial. But nevertheless, it is still uncomputable. Uh, and that's clear why uh, this definition involves all representations of A and all representations of B, uh, which are impossible to describe explicitly. Uh, fortunately, uh, a computable definition exists, and it is given by the following theorem. Let's choose a pair of faithful star representations. So suppose that A and B are C star algebras. Pi is a faithful star representation of A, and two is a faithful star representation of B. I claim that uh, then the spatial norm of U is equal to the norm of the following operator. So the point is that uh, we don't have to work with the universal representations. They are indeed faithful. But we may replace, if we look at the original definition of the spatial norm, we may replace uh, the universal representations by arbitrary faithful representations. And this is very useful because for many concrete sister algebras, there exist uh, faithful representations which are much more manageable than the universal representation. Uh, in fact, in many concrete examples, uh, a sister algebra is already uh, defined as a subalgebra on B of H for suitable H. So this is very useful for uh, applications to concrete sister algebras. The proof of this uh, theorem uh, will be uh, based on the following lemma. Uh, suppose we have two Hilbert spaces, a, H and K, Hilbert spaces, and let's consider the collection of all finite dimensional subspaces of H, that's denoted by FD of H set of all finite dimensional vector subspaces of H. And for every uh, finite dimensional subspace of H, that's uh, noted by L, uh, let PL denote the orthogonal projection onto 
onto L. So it is a bounded operator on H. I claim that uh, for every bounded linear operator T on the Hilbert tensor product of H and K, uh, we have the following formula. <coughs> the norm of T is equal to the following supremum taken over all finite dimensional subspaces of H uh, of the norms of the following operators, PL tensor the identity map, uh, T PL tensor the identity. Um, okay, uh, so why is it so? Uh, so we take uh, our operator T and we find an element U on the unit sphere. We choose an element U. Uh, in the algebraic, we may take it in the algebraic tensor product of H and K, uh, such that the norm of U is 1. And such that uh, the norm of T is almost uh, equal to the norm of T, T of U. So uh, formally, we start with uh, an arbitrary positive number epsilon. And for each epsilon, we choose such an element U, such that the norm of T is less than or equal to the norm of T of U plus epsilon. Such U exists just by the definition of the operator norm. And we can always choose it in the uncompleted tensor product uh, because it is dense in the Hilbert tensor product, and clearly the norm of uh, an operator is equal to the norm of its restriction to a dense subspace. So we can always find such an element U. So let's write U as a sum of finitely many elementary tensors, Xi tensor Yi from 1 to n. <coughs> uh, and let's observe observe that uh, for every element v in the Hilbert tensor product of H and K, uh, the following net uh, PL tensor 1 applied to v converges to v where L runs over all finite dimensional subspaces of H. Why is it so? Well, uh, this net is clearly bounded for the operator norm, because the norm of the orthogonal projection is 1. It is bounded, and we have the convergence on elementary tensors. So the net is bounded. And uh, uh, we have the convergence for elementary tensors. For every x and y. Uh, here we, we are using the fact that, uh, actually we have uh, already used this fact, fact some time ago. The fact is that if you have a bounded net of linear operators, uh, which converges pointwise on the total subset, then it converges pointwise everywhere. Well, this set is total in the Hilbert tensor product, so the net is bounded. So from uh, the convergence on the total subset implies the convergence uh, for, e for every v. Okay, so we have this convergence, uh, and let's now uh, substitute here t of u. Uh, so this implies that you know, there exists a finite dimensional subspace L of H uh, such that uh, T of U is close to, uh, to PL tensor 1 T of U. That is, this, the distance is less than epsilon.
And moreover, we may assume, we may also assume that, assume that L contains uh, our vectors x1 to xn. If, they, if uh, this L doesn't contain these vectors, then we just take uh, a bigger finite dimensional subspace which contains both L, both L and the linear span of these vectors. So this convergence implies that uh, this is uh, less than epsilon whenever L is bigger than some fixed uh, L0. So since our uh, set is directed, we may, we may always find L which satisfies both, both these conditions. Okay. <coughs> Now we, uh, let's compare this with uh, the, uh, mm, where is it? Uh, now we compare this with the right-hand side of this equality. This is almost, almost the right-hand side of this equality, but not exactly. So uh, the norm of t uh, is uh, less than or equal to the norm of t of u uh, plus epsilon. Now this uh, inequality implies that this is less than or equal to the norm of uh, PL tensor 1 t of u plus 2 epsilon. And let's now observe that we may replace here a, two, a u uh, by uh, this operator applied to u. PL tensor 1, T, PL tensor 1 applied to u plus to epsilon. And why is it so? This is true simply because that this vector is exactly u. And it's exactly u because uh, L contains, look here, L contains the vectors x1 to xn. So when we apply PL tensor 1 to our u, we get u. PL doesn't change uh, the vectors x1 to xn. Okay, so we have this inequality. And of course, this is less than or equal to the norm of PL tensor 1, T PL tensor 1 plus two epsilon, simply because the u uh, sits on the, on the unit sphere. And this completes the proof. So this implies that the norm of t is less than or equal to this supremum, but the opposite inequality is, is obvious. <clears throat> so this completes the proof of our lemma. And let's now come back to uh, the theorem. Proof of theorem. Uh, so since our original definition of um, the uh, spatial norm is given in terms of universal representations and they are also faithful, uh, what we want to prove is that the right hand side of this equality doesn't depend on the choice of pi and toe. So what we want to do is to show I want to show that uh, for each pair of uh, faithful representations, pi and pi prime of A, and uh, tau and tau prime of B, we have the following inequality, pi tensor tau applied to u equals pi prime tensor to prime applied to u. Uh, well, let's know the left-hand side of this equality like this, u pi to, and the right-hand side will be u pi prime to prime. 
So we want to show that these two uh, norms on the algebraic tensor product are the same. These are norms on the, on the algebraic tensor product, and we want to prove that they are the same. And uh, in fact, we can assume, we may assume without loss of generality that, for example, pi equals pi prime. Well, indeed, uh, um, to prove that, uh, uh, to prove the equality, be the equality between these norms uh, can be proved uh, in two steps. First, we uh, first we keep pi unchanged and replace tau by tau prime. This is the first step, and the second step is to keep uh, to keep the second representation unchanged and to replace pi by pi, pi prime. And so clearly these two steps are absolutely identical. They are similar to each other. So it's enough to consider only, only one of them. Okay. So uh, pi uh, acts from A to B of H. Mm tau acts from b to b of k, and uh, tau prime acts from b to b of k prime. Uh, let's introduce some notation. Let's introduce some notation. Uh, so for every finite dimensional subspace L of H, uh, let uh, JL denote the inclusion map of L into H, inclusion map. And we also need uh, a special notation uh, for the orthogonal projection PL but consider it as a map from H to L. Basically, QL acts uh, as PL, but uh, we consider PL as a map from H to itself. Uh, PL. PL is a map from H to itself, and we may consider it as a map from H to L. Formally, these are two different maps. One acts from H to itself, and another one acts from uh, H to L. So formally, we have uh, the following identity. Uh, GL composed with QL is PL. Uh, and on the other hand, QL composed with JL is just the identity map of L, just by construction. Uh, let's also consider uh, a representation IL. This will be a representation of the algebra B of L on H. So it acts from B of L to B of H. Now by the following simple formula, uh, L of T is uh, mm, G L T Q L. So we project H onto L, then we apply T, and then we embed the result into H. Uh, so um, informally, this uh, map acts uh, by the following picture, it uh, sends an operator to the upper left corner of this matrix, and we put zero and zero here. It's, and clearly, this is a faithful star representation. Faithful star representation. Uh, and we have another map, uh, phi L. Uh, it acts from H, from A, sorry, from A to B of L. And it acts by the following formula, phi L of A. Uh, so we look at the operator phi of A. It acts on H. Um, we uh, compose it with JL and, uh, and uh, QL, like this. So we just uh, restrict phi of A to L, apply phi of A. Uh, so in general, L is not invariant for pi of A, uh, 
And so, and so to come back to L, we compose it with the projection QL. Again, informally, this uh, um, map acts uh, by the following rule. It takes pi away to the upper left corner of this matrix. Of course, I don't claim that this is, an, uh, this is a representation. In general, this is not a representation. But anyway, this is a linear map. A linear map from A to B of L. And now I claim that for every element U in the algebraic tensor product, we have the following equality. So we uh, look at our lemma and uh, we substitute for T in, uh, the uh, operator pi tensor 2 applied to U. So I claim that this, the resulting operator, which uh, acts on the Hilbert tensor product, uh, is equal to the following one. So this is an equality in B of H tensor K. So look, U sits in A tensor B, so this uh, element sits in the algebraic tensor product of B of L and B, the uncompleted algebraic tensor product. Uh, and this is a representation of this algebra on H tensor K. So the, this operator acts on the same space H tensor K. Uh, well, the uh, the order we, we first we apply QL, then T, then GL. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. No, T T is an operator on L. This is an operator on L on the smaller space, and we uh, somehow extend it to to H uh, just. Uh, by the, this rule. So it is, uh, uh, um, it acts as T on L and it acts by zero on the orthogonal complement. <clears throat> okay, so um, this formula is a simple exercise, uh, a little calculation. Just uh, to prove this, ex uh, this formula, it's, of course, it's uh, enough to prove this in the case where U is an elementary tensor because uh, uh, the algebraic tensor product is spanned by elementary tensors. And for elementary tensors, this is just a line, a little calculation, uh, which is absolutely elementary. Uh, okay, so how does it help? How does it help? Uh, let's look at the following picture. Uh, we may consider two representations of the same algebra, or the algebraic tensor product of B of L and B. Mm, one of them is uh, um, uh, one of them is I L tensor two, and it acts on H tensor K. And another one is I L tensor two prime, and it acts on H tensor K prime. Both are faithful star representations because uh, I L two and tau prime are faithful. And I claim that for every element in uh, this algebra, we have the full inequality. The norms of these elements are the same for every V in this algebra. Because L is finite dimensional, so B of L is uh, isomorphic to the matrix algebra. 
And we proved uh, some time ago at the previous lecture that uh, there is a unique system norm on the tensor product of a sister algebra by uh, a matrix algebra. Because M M tensor B has a unique sister norm. So this is the point where we use the uniqueness of this norm. So it is unique. This is a sister norm. This is a sister norm. So they are the same. Okay. So now, how does it help? Now we simply combine. We simply combine this equality, this equality, and our lemma. Oops. <coughs> So we calculate uh, the norm pi tensor two of u by using the lemma. So by lemma, this is the following supremum pi L tensor one uh, pi tensor two of u pi L tensor one. The supremum is taken over all finite dimensional subspaces, L. Now we uh, use, uh, mm, we use uh, this equality, and we see that this is equal to the norm, uh, well, supremum over L of the norm. So the following operators, uh, I L tensor two, uh, Phi L tensor one applied to you. Uh, now we use uh, this equality, and we see that we, we may replace their two by two prime. The supremum over L. I L tensor two prime applied to the same element phi L tensor one applied to you. Okay. And so now coming back to uh, expression of this form, but now with tau replaced by tau prime, what we get is uh, exactly the norm of the operator phi tensor tau prime applied to you. So as a result, we see that when we uh, replace tau by tau prime, we get the same number. And this completes the proof. So once again, I'd like to stress that the key point here is that is the uniqueness of the sister norm on the tensor product by the matrix algebra. Also, let's observe that um, uh, this result, uh, this theorem actually uh, follows from uh, the minimality of the, it is immediate from the minimality of the uh, spatial uh, norm on the tensor product. Uh, but uh, I, uh, I would like to use Takisaki's theorem because we didn't prove it. So this is basically the, uh, this, is, this is another way of, you, of proving this uh, theorem without, uh, without um, invoking uh, Takisaki's result. <coughs> okay. Uh, so we get the following useful corollary, corollary one. Uh, suppose that we have a C star subalgebras of B of H and, and of B of K respectively. So A is a C star subalgebra of B of H and B is a C star subalgebra of B of K. C star subalgebras. Then their spatial tensor product is just the closure of the algebraic tensor product in the algebra of operators on, H ten on the Hilbert tensor product. So just take the, uh, the uh, inclusions of B of H and 
of, uh, of A into B of H and B into B of K and apply our theorem. This is very useful, and by the way, this explains why the spatial tensor product is so, it is so called. It is spatial because it, uh, it is very convenient to describe in terms of representations of our algebras on Hilbert spaces. If they are already act on Hilbert spaces, then the tensor product is just the uh, tensor product algebra, or the closure of, a ten of the tensor product operator algebra. Uh, well, let's now apply this result to, um, to a concrete uh, situation, corollary two. If you have two Hilbert spaces, say H1 and H2, then uh, the spatial tensor product of the algebras of compact operators, K of H1 and K of H2, is nothing but the algebra of compact operators on the Hilbert tensor product, H1 and H2. <coughs> uh, to prove this corollary, uh, let's uh, introduce some notation. Some notation. In, uh, if you have a Hilbert space H, if H is a Hilbert space, and if you have two vectors, X and Y, in H, uh, then we can consider uh, the following rank one, op rank one operator, which will be denoted like this, uh, x circle y. Uh, it acts from h to itself, and it acts by the following simple formula. It takes every vector z to the inner product of z and y and multiply it by x. So this is a rank one operator. Its range is the one dimensional space spanned by X. Uh, if we take the linear span of all such operators, X circle Y, where X and Y run over H, then this linear span is nothing but the space of all bounded operators of finite rank. Bounded operators on H of finite rank. And it's a standard fact of functional analysis that the space is dense in the space of compact operators. It is dense in K of H. This is a fact. Uh, so let's now apply this fact to uh, proving corollary two. <coughs> Proof of corollary two. Uh, so by corollary one, the uh, um, spatial tensor product is just the closure of K of H1 tensor K of H2, and the closure is taken in the algebra of bounded operators on H1 tensor H2. Now, uh, since we take a closure here, we may replace here K of H1 and K of H2 by suitable dense subspaces. Since uh, we take the closure here, the result will be the same. It will be convenient to take here the spaces of bounded finite rank operators. So this is the linear span of all elements of the form X1 circle Y1, where X1 and Y1 run over H1. Uh, tensor, linear span, of all operators of the form x2 circle y2, where x2 and y2 run over h2. And we take a closure. Now this uh, can be more conveniently written in the following form. Uh, this is just a linear span of all elements of the following form. So the tensor product operator of this one and this one is again a rank one operator corresponding to the elementary tensors, x1 tensor x2 and y1 tensor y2. 
And again, uh, x1 and y1 run over h1, and h, uh, x2 and y2 run over h2. And we take a closure. Uh, but now, uh, elementary tensors uh, are total in uh, the Hilbert direct product. Uh, is in the, sorry, in the Hilbert uh, tensor product. So uh, therefore, we may replace here elementary tensors by arbitrary elements of the uh, tensor product. Uh, let's denote them by, say, xi and eta. So xi runs over. Uh, oh, sorry, I. Mm, uh, okay, that's true. Uh, so our psi runs uh, over uh, H mm, one tensor H two and uh, and eta also runs over the same space. And we take take a closure again. But what is this? This is nothing but the closure of the uh, of the space of finite running operators on the Hilbert tensor product. So this is uh, the space of compact operators on H1 tensor H2. And that's it. So this completes the proof. Спасибо, Дан. Thank you. This is, of course, uh, here I mean the rank one operator. Thank you. Uh, okay. So uh, we see that the tensor product, the minimal tensor product of two algebras of compact operators is the algebra of compact operators on the uh, Hilbert tensor product. By the way, the initial question is, what if we take the algebras of all bounded operators? Well, uh, if we take the algebras of all bounded operators, then again, by, the, uh, by our theorem, we have uh, an isometric inclusion of this algebra into the algebra of bounded operators on the Hilbert tensor product. An isometric inclusion. So the exercise uh, uh, is uh, the following natural question. Is it an isomorphism? Is it an isomorphism? It's rather easy to show that this is an isomorphism if one of them is finite dimensional. But what happens in the general case? That's a question. Okay, now our next goal is uh, to apply um, our theorem to um, tensor products by commutative system algebras. In other words, by uh, algebras of continuous and vanishing at infinity, at infinity functions on lo locally compact spaces. Let's introduce some notation. Suppose that X is uh, a locally compact Hausdorff topological space and E is a Banach space. Then we denote by C0 of Xe uh, the space of those continuous functions from X to E. F is continuous. Uh, such that the function which takes x to the norm of f of x vanishes at infinity. So this is the vector valued vector valued c zero space. Uh, the following exercise describes some basic properties of this space. First of all, I claim that this is a Banach space. C0 of Xe is a Banach space with respect to the supremum norm, the norm of F, 
is defined to be the supremum of the norms of f of x, where x runs over x. Basically, the completeness is proved ex uh, exactly in the same way as in the case where E is just uh, the complex numbers. Second, if uh, we have a sister algebra, if A is a sister algebra, then uh, C0 of XA is also a sister algebra. With respect to this norm, with respect to the obvious multiplication, which is taken pointwise, and uh, with respect to the involution, which is also defined pointwise. And finally, uh, property three, uh, let's consider the map. Again, we come back to the more general situation where E is a bulk space. And let's consider the map from the tensor product of C0 of X and E. So take the usual algebraic tensor product. And we consider the map from this tensor product to C0 of XE. Uh, let's denote it by phi. It is given by the following formula. Uh, it takes every elementary tensor, phi tensor, tensor V, uh, to the function. Uh, which takes x to f of x v. Clearly, uh, there exists a unique linear map satisfying this property. So uh, the exercise is to show that this map has a dense range. A possible approach to this exercise is to use partitions of unity. So now our goal is to show that uh, this map, in the case where E is a sister algebra, extends to an isometric star isomorphism between the respective algebras. So we have the following theorem. If A is a sister algebra, and X is a locally compact, a locally compact Hausdorff topological space. Uh, then there exists an isometric star isomorphism from uh, the spatial tensor product of C0 of X and A uh, to uh, C0 of X, A, which is uniquely determined by the following formula. It takes F tensor V to the function, which takes X to F of X, A. So in other words, this is just the extension uh, of, uh, of this map phi. Uh, to prove this result, uh, let's choose a faithful star representation of A. So pi is a faithful star representation of A on the Hilbert space H. And we consider a special uh, star representation of C0 of X, let's denote it by M. It, uh, it is uh, a representation of C0 of X on the Hilbert space a little L2 of X, which consists of all 
uh, square summable families on X. Or if you like, this is a big alto space with respect to the counting measure. M acts uh, in, a, in a very simple way. It takes every function F to the respective multiplication operator. So M of F takes G to the pointwise product of F and G. This is also a faithful star representation. Now let's look at the following diagram. Uh, so we take the algebraic tensor product of C0 of X and A. We consider the tensor product representation of, pi and, and of M and pi, which induces the a spatial tensor norm on this algebra. So this is M tensor pi. So this is the representation of the space on the Hilbert tensor product of uh, L little L2 of X and H. Uh, now this space actually can be identified with the space of uh, square summable families uh, of elements of H, or little L2 of X H. And here we have a, a very explicit isomorphism. Um, let me denote it by A G of U, and I'll explain in a minute what, what it means. Uh, well, here we have our map phi from this algebra to C0 of XA, which is described here. We already know that it has dense range. And here we have uh, another representation, m pi, uh, which I'll define in a minute. So uh, let's now uh, explain uh, these errors. First of all, what is u? Here u is a unitary isomorphism between these two Hilbert spaces, L2 of x tensor h to the space of square summable families. Uh, and it is uniquely determined by the following formula. It takes uh, G tensor H, every element of tensor where G is in here and little h is in here, uh, to the function. So this space is consists of H valued functions on X. Uh, so uh, the, this function is given by the following formula, g of x h. And uh, you, we know that u is a unitary isomorphism. Uh, we discussed this some time ago, actually at the previous lecture when we discussed Hilbert tensor products. This is a unitary isomorphism between these two Hilbert spaces. So what is AD of u? A D of U is just the uh, conjugation by U. Uh, so A D of U is uh, given by the following formula. It uh, takes every operator T to U T U inverse. And since U is unitary, uh, AD of U is, uh, is an isometric star isomorphism. Okay, so uh, finally to explain this diagram, I must define M pi. M pi uh, is a representation of the algebra C0 of XA on the space of uh, square summable H valued functions. And it acts by the following formula. It takes every F uh, to the operator, which uh, takes uh, every function G to another function in the same space, uh, given by the following formula. So 
here uh, G sits in the little L2 space and F is uh, in C0 of XA. So this is clearly well defined. G of X, if we take X, then G of X uh, sits on H. So this is a vector in H. And this is an operator on H because F of X sits in A and pi of F of X is an operator on H. So we apply this operator to this vector. We get another vector which, which depends on X, so it, it's a square sum of a function. Uh, it's uh, very easy to show that M pi is also a faithful star representation. M pi is a faithful star representation. This is a little exercise for you, but it is very easy. Uh, the fact that it is a star representation follows from this formula, and uh, it is faithful mostly because pi is a faithful. Okay, now all of the ingredients of the diagram are well defined, and I claim that the diagram commutes. This is also a straightforward calculation. The diagram commutes. Uh, let's now look at the diagram. Uh, so what can, what can we say about these arrows? This is an isometric star isomorphism. Uh, this is isometric because it is a faithful star representation. Uh, uh, this one is isometric for the spatial tensor norm here just by the definition, well, by, by our third definition of the spatial norm, because these representations are faithful. So all the errors are isometric. Uh, this implies that phi is also isometric. So this implies that phi uh, is an isometric map between uh, this tensor product algebra equipped with the spatial C star norm to uh, C0 of Xa. And since it is isometric, it, uh, mm, we already know that it has dense range and has dense range. So it is uniquely extends, it uniquely extends to an isometric star isomorphism. To an isometric star isomorphism between our algebras between the spatial tensor product and the algebra C0 of Xa. <coughs> and this completes the proof. Uh, as a special case of this uh, theorem, we get the following corollary. Uh, suppose we have two locally compact Hausdorff spaces, X and Y. X and Y are locally compact Hausdorff topological spaces. I claim that then there exists uh, an isometric star isomorphism, an isometric star isomorphism from the um, spatial tensor product of C0 of X and C0, C0 of Y and the algebra C0 on the product X and Y are uh, uniquely determined by the following formula. It takes every elementary tensor of the form F tensor G uh, to the function which takes each pair x and y to f of x, g of y. Uh, the proof is a combination of our theorem with, um, with a useful exercise in general topology. 
So the proof is to apply apply uh, our theorem to uh, the algebra C0 of Y and uh, use the isomorphism between uh, the algebra C0 of X from, C from X to C0 of Y from this algebra uh, to the algebra of uh, C0 functions on the product. And this isomorphism is a good exercise in general topology. Okay. Well, uh, that's all I wanted to tell you about the minimal tensor product. Uh, so our next goal will be to discuss, uh, to briefly discuss the so-called maximal tensor product. So some time ago, I have already told you that um, there are at least two natural ways of uh, defining a sister norm on the tensor product of two sister algebras. So the first natural choice is to take the minimal sister norm, which we've just discussed. And the second one is to consider the so-called maximal uh, sister norm. Uh, we'll mm, discuss it rather briefly because uh, it is not uh, directly related to our course, but uh, nevertheless, um, it's a rather uh, classical uh, construction. So uh, mm, the beginning of the next lecture will be devoted to the maximal tensor product and to the uh, classical notion of a nuclear sister algebra. Uh, and then we um, discuss uh, uh, the so-called sister envelopes. The sister envelope is um, uh, a construction which, um, uh, um, which produces a sister algebra satisfying some, some uh, universal properties. And then we'll be, we will be ready to discuss compact uh, quantum groups. Okay, so that's all for today. Thank you. Okay, so that's all for today. Thank you.